The Lord be with you. Welcome this morning to our online matin service. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent. We call it Utica. This is from John chapter 8, when our Lord has a confrontation with uh, the Jews who did not believe in him. And he tells them that uh, before Abraham was, I am. And they pick up stones to throw him, or to, to, they pick up stones to throw at him. Everything we need for worship will be on our screen for us, and so we begin with the Office of Matins. O oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and redeemed his people. Thank you. 
reading from Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from Hebrews chapter 9. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from John chapter 8. Jesus asks, Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, 
my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of, who, of, him you, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, and whose sin is put away. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, there are certain topics that the Bible discusses that Christians kind of shy away from and try not to bring up too much, for one reason or another. The teaching of Holy Scripture is, after all, not always politically correct. One of those topics is that of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the Jews who did not believe in him. Maybe the vicious persecution of the Jews by criminals like Hitler makes Christians feel uncomfortable about criticizing modern Judaism as a religion. But whether it's by a confusion of categories or a concern for good manners, Christians feel uncomfortable with texts like this, criticizing perhaps what their Jewish neighbors might teach. We could just ignore the whole topic, but Jesus did say what he said. This really did happen. And what he said is set before us as today's gospel for the fifth Sunday in Lent. So how do we deal with texts like this? Should we apologize for Jesus and go on a, a long campaign to apologize to the world for the harsh sayings of our Lord Christ? Should we apologize for, say, for Jesus saying to the Jews that they are not of God, have not known God, and that they are liars? He's kind of blunt here, really. Should we shy away from speaking the way that our Lord has spoken? After all, we know better. Times have changed, right? The, the rules of the game have changed. Such fierce polemics, while once tolerated, are no longer regarded as appropriate religious speech in the public square. Well, I mean, come on. That's because we live in a time of denial. People are constantly fighting against nature. They're fighting against the truth. Denying the truth of God for the sake of a false humanistic unity is not only the religious style, it is in fact the modern religious creed. It is, after all, the creed of that modern false teaching, that apostasy, which is secular humanism, which says that it's possible to be neutral in the battle between God and death and the devil. But we should talk the way our Lord has talked. Woe to the Christian who doesn't talk the way our Lord talked. Now, in the world, it's the opposite. In, in the world, it's woe to the Christian who talks the way Jesus talked, because that's too harsh. But in reality, woe to the Christian who doesn't talk the way Jesus talked. We should talk 
the way Jesus taught. We should oppose the prevailing religious culture and imitate our Lord Christ. And the reason, by the way, that we challenge the, the, the cultural fashions, the reason that we're kind of countercultural religiously, is not because we're looking for fights or we want to start arguments. It's not that at all. But we have to reckon with the life and death seriousness of what Jesus has to teach us. Note what the Jews attacked, by the way. They attacked Jesus because of what he said. They've been trying to catch him in some kind of wrongdoing, and they can't get him on personal scandal. They can't find any sin in him, which is not surprising because there, he has no sin. He even asks earlier in the chapter, which of you convicts me of sin? And no one could. No one could do it. So if no one could convict Jesus of sin, why didn't they just believe what he said? Well, Jesus explains why. He says, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. You see, the fact is that God is not just who you fashion him to be. It's not like that. God's word is not whatever you imagine it is. God is God with or without your participation in the thing. God is God without your input, your experiences. God is God with or without you. You don't make God into God. God is who he is. In fact, that's his name. I am who I am. When God appeared to Moses at the beginning of the book of Exodus and told him that he was going to lead God's people out of the slavery of Egypt and into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, Moses asked the Lord what name he should give to his people when they asked him who sent him. Who is the God of our fathers, the God who was sending Moses to set us free? And God replied, as recorded by Moses in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. There is no other God than the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. There is no other God than the one who appeared to Abraham and said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And dear Christian, there is no other God than the one who entered into the most holy place by his own blood and won redemption for us all. He became a man. He became the great high priest. He made the holy offering of his own lifeblood on the altar of the cross. This was a sacrifice to God. It fulfilled all the sacrifices uh, that God through Moses had commanded the people of Israel. Every year the priest would go into the most holy place and sprinkle the blood of sacrificial animals on the mercy seat. Only through the shedding of blood could there be forgiveness of sins. The mercy seat became the cross of Calvary, where Jesus, the God-man, offered up to the penal justice of God the final bloody sacrifice by which all of humanity was redeemed and set free from sin. It won for the whole world the eternal inheritance that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. The promise of life and blessing that God had given to, to his people from Abraham onward was a promise that was realized in Jesus Christ, who is the high priest. And this is how Jesus could speak with the authority of God himself. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Jesus is the same God who spoke to Abraham and promised that in him all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus is the God who spoke to Moses and identified himself as I am. Jesus is the same God who became a man in order to be both the high priest and the sacrifice of atonement 
which establishes peace between the holy God and this sinful world by bearing the sin of the world and taking it away. And this is how Jesus can say, Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Who do you think you are, Jesus? This is what the Jews asked him. That's what they still ask today. And the Christians must respond to the Jewish denial that Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christians must confess the words of rebuke that Jesus spoke to the unbelieving Jews of his day that apply equally to all manifestations of unbelief today. The only true God is the one God who stood before the Jews and promised them eternal life. The only true God is the God who stood before Pilate and claimed that his kingdom is not of this world. The only true God is the God who was betrayed into the hands of sinners, given over to Roman soldiers to be whipped, pronounced innocent by Pontius Pilate repeatedly before he finally caved to the crowd and ordered him crucified, who was nailed to the cross to suffer and die. This is God, and there is none other. But if you say now that Jews who don't believe in Jesus are lost forever, you're called a narrow-minded religious bigot. But it's not just the Jews who don't believe in Jesus who will be lost forever. It's all who don't believe in Jesus who will be lost forever. Yes, the Jews and the Muslims and the Hindus and the Buddhists and the secular humanists and the radical atheists and the animists and everybody else, even nominal Christians who claim to believe in Christ but don't, all those who don't keep Jesus' word will be lost. And it is our charge as the church to speak this truth to the world, whether it's in season or not. And the fury and the disdain that the Jews heaped upon Jesus was not accidental. It came from their pain. It hurts inside to hear that your religious faith is wrong. The people wanted the kingdom without the king. They wanted God without the Christ. They wanted to be children of God without the necessity of God's son bearing their sins to take them away. They wanted a good, orderly system of ethics, morality, high standards, a holy way of living, and a close relationship of, with God, but they wanted all these things on their own terms. Well, God won't have it. He will deal with us only on his terms, and he will deal with us only through his Son. Jesus made this crystal clear to these Jews who challenged him. He honored his Father, and his Father honored him. There is no daylight between him and his father. The one and the other must go together and cannot be separated. He and the father of the same substance, bearing the same name, the name I am, that transcends time and space and anything else humanity might think or say or do. From eternity to eternity, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. The Holy Trinity is the only God who exists and the only God who is to be worshipped. It's this exclusive claim of Jesus, then, who angered his religious critics. If he had supplemented the wisdom of the previous rabbis with his own, that might have been acceptable. But he would have none of that. It is his word that we must keep if we are to have eternal life. Who do you think you are? They ask. Well, Jesus tells them. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Notice, he doesn't say I was to say that I'm older than Abraham. He's saying much more, something much more profound than that. Not just before Abraham was, I was. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Which is to say, I am and always have been and ever shall be. He's confessing to be eternal. When Jesus says, I am, Jesus is saying, I'm God. The same God who spoke to Moses in the burning bush. And the point was not missed by those who heard his words, because that's the point at which they rent their garments and picked up stones to stone him. The man they hated was claiming to be the one and only God, and this was to them intolerable. 
And it is blasphemy to claim to be God if you're not God. But it wasn't blasphemy when Jesus said it because he is God. Why do people chafe at Jesus' claims? Why do they become angry at this Christian insistence that Jesus is the only way to the Father and that apart from faith in him, there's nothing but death and damnation? I think we know why. It's because Jesus can't save you unless you're a sinner. Jesus can't give you eternal life unless without him you face eternal death. Jesus cannot give you words which, if you keep them, will keep you from ever seeing or tasting death unless without those words you will taste death. You will see death, and you will be conquered by it. Jesus himself faced death. Death is is the separation of the body and the soul, yes. But it's not only that. Death is the result of sin. We should never forget this. St. Paul says that the wages of sin is death. The connection between sin and death is one of cause and effect. They go together And they they really can't be separated. To face death, then, is to see your sin as it separates you from God, from those you love, from hope, from joy, and especially from peace with God. It is to be damned. Death leaves you literally hopeless. But it's not that you cease to exist. It's rather that you continue to exist in a state of alienation from the God who made you, and in a condition of unresolved bitterness and regret and an unfathomable sense of loss. Regret without any recourse. That's what tasting death really is. But Jesus promises that if you keep his word, you won't taste death. You won't see death. But you'll pass right on through death without death even touching you. That's because Jesus has already confronted and defeated death. His word is the teaching of the gospel that we Christians trust in, and to keep that is to hold on to it in faith, to believe it, to guard of it, to trust it, to hold, to lay hold of it for dear life. When we Christians reject false religions, such as those held by the Jews who rejected Jesus, we do so not in arrogance, but quite the opposite. We do so with a sense of our own unworthiness. We recall that our father Abraham, who is our father by faith, he was called by God out of idolatry and obtained the status as father of the faithful only by God's grace through faith. That's the same grace that we live by now. We don't rely on how faithful we've been. We don't trust in how successful we've been. We don't look to our own obedience as paving our path to heaven. We confess our sins, and we live only by mercy. That means that we live only by the word of Jesus. We read the Bible. We go to church. We eat and drink Jesus' body and blood. We wash ourselves on our baptism daily, returning where we were born again, and never progressing beyond the status that God gave us then and there. We don't trust in our religious pedigree, We don't trust whether our parents or great-grandparents or our ancient ancestors were Christians. We live on the word of Jesus. We confess it in its fullness. We refuse to back away even when it becomes unpopular. And we cheerfully disobey the rules of the religious in crowd designed to place all the religions on the same level. We confess Jesus alone as the high priest, as Abraham's God and ours. We claim the life that he alone can give with the certainty of faith that we will never see or taste death. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.